Hey everyone, uh, if you'd please take your seat, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so thank you for coming to Beyond Porting, how modern OpenGL can radically reduce driver overhead. And please welcome John McDonald and Cass Everett from NVIDIA. Uh, hi everybody, uh, I'm John McDonald. Um, Cass will be coming up in the middle. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, you, guys, you guys do know that Abrash is talking about BR in the other room, right? Uh, we, we, we would be there, except we're here, so. Um, yeah, so we want to talk today basically about how to um, radically reduce your driver overhead if you're doing OpenGL. This is something that's basically, we're, we're not talking about, oh, I did a D3D port. These are things that we feel like are um, effectively impossible with uh, D3D, uh, and they're only possible with OpenGL. Um, so we want to talk about a few topics that uh, I've been, you know, I basically I work with developers all the time, and, and uh, especially I've been working with a lot of developers on their OpenGL ports. Uh, and so, uh, you know, th these sorts of topics come up over and over and over again, and so it's like, hey, let's figure out a better way to do these. Uh, so we want to talk today about uh, dynamic buffer generation, um, efficient texture management, and then how to basically get just a crap ton more draw calls. So that's a technical term. Uh, so first we're going to talk about, uh, or I'm going to talk about dynamic buffer generation. Um, the problem basically is that, you know, I, developers often come to me and they say, I would really like to be able to generate my geometry in place, in memory, and I don't want to pay for a mem copy, I don't want to have to call, uh, you know, buffer uh, subdata or buffer data every time. Um, this is, you know, primarily for uh, geometry data uh, that will be used basically once. You know, particle systems are the overwhelmingly most common sort of example of this, but um, physically reactive vegetation and foliage is also you know, reasonable. Uh, so a typical, very simplified solution to this a lot of times uh, kind of looks like this. The code sort of basically says, oh, I'm, I'm going to bind an array buffer. Uh, you know, I need to do an unsynchronized uh, map, and I want to just write the data I'm not interested in reading. They figure out, you know, maybe what the particle size is. They do, you know, a map buffer with these access flags they set the particle data, and then they unmap, and then they add their offset. And then eventually, you're done doing all your updates, and you render it. This is a little egregious, because usually people will do clusters of particles at a time, or spans of particles. But uh, in the limit, it winds up being you know, one at a time. And the problem here is that this just, just is a destroyer of perf. It absolutely uh, nukes perf. Um, and you might be thinking, well, I, I used the map unsynchronized bit, so why is that slow? It's supposed to be unsynchronized. Um, to sort of understand that, we have to take a step back and look at how the driver, modern drivers work. So uh, modern OpenGL drivers uh, operate on a technique that we sort of call dual core. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what AMD calls it, but uh, we call it a dual core driver. And so effectively, there's a piece of the driver in your thread, and there's a piece of the driver um, on another thread, uh, and the application, the sort of the piece that's in your thread is very, very, very thin. Uh, it's all it's doing is just packaging up at the tiniest amount of work that it can, and then shipping it across the wire once it's got enough uh, to the other thread. This is super common, you know. Um, like I see lots of games that do the same thing, where they're like, "Oh, I, you know, want to push my talking to D3D to another thread." They they have a similar um, situation. So. Uh, we can sort of see the uh, visualization here. Um, effectively, you've got like the application at the top, and it's talking across the wire. This is sort of like a time diagram, so time is moving from left to right. And uh, the application is generating commands, and it's talking to the driver, and the driver is responding pretty much right away and saying, yep, yep, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, everything's great. But really what it's doing is just building up workloads, and then when it gets enough, it kicks it across a thread boundary to the server uh, thread. Um, and, and then basically that does the work that turns it into push buffers, then it eventually kicks it, it gets up enough work, it kicks it across to the GPU, the GPU processes, everything is schmooing along, and this is a very happy, healthy driver interaction. This is, um, this is great. The problem with map unsynchronized, we finally come back to, is that it does avoid an application to GPU sync point, a CPU, GP, uh, a CPU GPU sync point, which if you've seen me talk about, I talk about them almost every talk I give. Uh, but the problem is that this does cause the client and the server threads uh, to serialize. So everything that's pending for the, um, the server thread has to complete. Uh, and the issue fundamentally is that, you, is that the, the, um, the client thread doesn't know if you've maybe done a buffer rename or if you've changed the contents of the buffer in a way that it's actually going to have to reflect back to you. It doesn't know if those, um, uh, those commands could be pending but not yet processed by the server thread. So it has to say, all right, I need the server thread to actually finish uh, 
uh, before it can do so. So we look again here, you know, this again, this was what our healthy driver uh, interaction looked like. And when we introduce a call like map unsynchronized, you get this. Um, so what happens is this red call basically was effectively a map unsynchronized. Uh, you see that the, the client thread, uh, sorry, the client portion of the driver just sits there and spins and has to wait while all of that work from the server thread gets completed. Then we finally get to where we can service this command, everything gets returned, and this inserts this sort of perf bubble that just propagates on down. <coughs> now, that's why map unsynchronized is not great. But I argue that map unsynchronized is sort of the wrong thing anyways. You don't really want unsynchronized maps. What you really want is just to say, dude, just give me a buffer that I can work on, and I don't care if the GPU is sourcing from it. I'll be careful. I won't stomp on you know, anything in flight. Uh, let me just keep it mapped forever and work in it. And our buffer storage lets you do that. So our buffer storage is uh, conceptually similar to our texture storage. Uh, obviously, it's for buffers. Uh, you basically get an immutable pointer, or we call what we call an immutable pointer, to the storage for a buffer. That means that the pointer itself can never change, but the contents you can just dance all over, do whatever you want. Um, so, you know, for GL terms, that means that buffer data uh, is off limits, but buffer subdata, a okay. Uh, another thing that our texture storage did was it basically uh, lets us specify some extra information at create time. And the two things that we really care about here are the persistent and coherent bits. So persistence just says, let me keep this thing mapped all the time. I don't care if the GPU needs to source from it. And then coherency uh, basically just also uh, lets you say, and also when I make a write here, if I then issue a GPU command, I want that write to show up right away without any additional driver interaction. Um, you can actually also use uh, uh, these types of buffers to stream data back, uh, you know, for, for example, doing persistently mapped PBOs to do asynchronous readback. Um, we're, we're not going to talk about that today, but uh, yeah. Uh, throughout the slides, I'm going to have these little sort of call-outs to the GL spec. They're just basically, if you want to go and read the nitty-gritty of how the spec works, you can go to the URL. The slides will be posted online later. In fact, uh, the talk will be online later, so you, know, you can just pull them there or whatever. So the other thing uh, that uh, our buffer storage does is it affects um, the mapping behavior. When you use map buffer range, you can basically say, I want uh, that map buffer range to be persistent and coherent. And now we have a solution. We can basically map something once, keep it mapped forever, and then you know, unmap it when we're about ready to destroy it. Uh, these types of buffers are great for dynamic, like really dynamic vertex and uh, index buffer, um, things that you're going to change every draw call anyways. Uh, and then these things called multi-draw indirect uh, command buffers, which we're going to talk about uh, a bit later. They're not really a good fit for static geometry buffers um, because you, you can pay, uh, basically there's some benefit for the GPU if you're going to be sourcing the data over and over and over again. There's some benefit that it can get that it just can't deal with for persistently mapped buffers, at least for the sort of short to medium term. All right, so we have persistently mapped buffers. Uh, and we want to make our particle system update better. <clears throat> so we basically, at the beginning of time, we were gonna, when we're going to create this buffer, we specify the flags that we want. We say, we're only going to write to it. We want it to be persistent. We want the writes to be coherent. Um, we use buff the buffer storage call. We specify that the thing is an array buffer. We say how large we're going to be. We're not providing any initial data, and, and you know, here are our flags. And then we call map, buff map buffer range right away to get the pointer back to where we're going to do all of our scribbling for the rest of time. We're also, um, that thing will basically be a member variable or you know, a static variable in a C file somewhere or whatever. Uh, and same thing with M offset. We need to basically keep track of this because we're going to basically treat M particle dust like it's a, uh, a ring buffer. Um, and, and we're just going to roll on through it. Now, I, I mentioned here that all particle size should actually be probably 3x one frames worth of particles to avoid stalling. You can get by with less in some cases. You can, you know, there are some situations where you need to use more, uh, you know, play around with it. So the old loop, again, this is what we had before. Um, we had that really atrocious map and unmap every time. Uh, and when we use our persistently mapped buffers, we get to clean up a lot of that stuff. Uh, so now, basically, we just need to get the particle size, we write the particle to the offset location, um, and then you know, we update the offset. I'm not showing the fact that it's a circular buffer because it's PowerPoint and you know, uh, code on slides is a pain in the ass. Um, 
but you would do that. Don't, don't not do that. So uh, I've been working with um, a, uh, a developer who probably everyone here is familiar with, but I didn't ask if I could use his name, so I'm not going to use his name. And uh, we, he basically came to me and he said, hey, I, I wrote this little test app. Um, it basically renders the lamest point sprites imaginable. These are basically just uh, little two by two triangles or one by one triangles that are spaced out one pixel. It renders 160,000 of them a frame and the perf sucks. And I was like, okay, man, let's, uh, let's, let's look at this. So he, uh, he says, I'm, you know, I do 160,000 of a frame. I just do one uh, particle at a time. They're specified as basically quads. And, um, and it's totally synthetic. But with Map Unsynchronized, I'm just getting this brutally terrible perf. I'm only getting about 220,000 particles a second. And, he said, and I said, hey, have you looked at buffer subdata? And he said, eh, buffer subdata is better. I'm getting about 18-ish frames a second. Um, but, I, uh, but that's still not as good as just D3D11 map no overwrite, where I'm getting 20.25. I was like, well, I think, I think you actually want to do persistently mapped buffers. You should try those instead. So I uh, implemented that code path for him, and we played around with it some more. And, uh, we got uh, 80 frames a second for about a 4x speed up over D3D11's path. Uh, so we were really happy with that. Um, we, I actually think that there's uh, probably a 2x factor of perf here that I could get in addition to what we have already, but I, I just I didn't have time to really dig into it. So um, uh, let's see here. OK, so there's always another shoe in graphics, right? Uh, so as I've mentioned several times, you have to be responsible for not stomping on the data in flight. Uh, and uh, that, that basically will mean fencing, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and there's this 3x multiplier. So why is it 3x? Well, there's what the GPU is using right now. There's what's probably staged and waiting to be pushed up to the GPU. And then there's what you're writing to. You, you can almost definitely uh, drop to 2x. The problem in, is if you wind up with a long frame, then you wind up in a situation where you're like, I'm ready to write, but I have nowhere to write to yet. So 3x sort of guarantees that this should never be a choke point. Um, now, even though that, that should be enough to guarantee that there's uh, enough room, you do need defense, basically, to make sure. So uh, <clears throat> um, in OpenGL, I just wanted to briefly cover this. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with it. You use, basically, GL fence sync to place a fence. And then basically, when you're ready, like you, you, so you place the fence, and then you remember that fence sync object that you just placed. And then later, when you're like, all right, I'm ready to start writing on this range again, you effectively just say, OK, I need to do a client weight sync right here. Now, a client weight sync will, do, uh, will cause all the way up to a CPU GPU sync point if the GPU has to finish work in order for that fence to be retired. Um, so you basically want to wrap that uh, function with a performance counter. What, what should happen? basically all the time, is that uh, the client wait sync should immediately return already, already retired or already returned. Um, and it should basically take zero time at all. Uh, obviously, if it doesn't, then you have a sizing problem, and uh, you should uh, complain to your log file so you can fix that. And then um, I gave a talk a couple years ago at GDC about efficient buffer management. It covers sort of this whole uh, idea, but without persistently mapped buffers, the whole you know, correctness for uh, fencing and everything. Um, uh, in detail, so I suggest looking there if, you're, uh, if you uh, need more information on, on that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to have uh, Cass come up, and he is going to talk about uh, efficient texture management. Um, and uh, yeah. All right, hello. Um, so this this uh, this part of the talk is about efficient texture management. The 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 teapot is apropos of nothing. However, uh, every graphics talk really can use teapots. So um, so I have one on my shirt. I have one on my slides, and I'm, that'll be the last that we see them. I bet. Um, so um, the problem that we have in in graphics with texture management um, that's that's uh, sort of worth considering is when we talk about API overhead and the things that that can hurt your performance. Um, one of the big things is how many draw calls do you make? How many state changes between draw calls do you make? And things like that. And so. One of the things that we can do that's a relatively straightforward thing to do is to take the textures that we have and instead of having them all live in separate uh, texture objects. Um, uh, we, we can put them together in, in, uh, to arrays. 
Um, and we can use bind lists uh, as, as another means. This is, uh, this is something that, that's a relatively new um, uh, set of functionality uh, to allow us to, um, to, to access um, uh, textures um, without having to go through, um, uh, through, through the, the name table binding a texture to, to uh, a, a particular texture unit um, and rendering. Um, there are some reasons why using texture arrays are handy in the context of bind lists that are specific to NVIDIA GPUs and probably not especially important other than to say that if you use texture arrays, that's actually goodness. Um, so uh, in, in the context of, of managing texture memory, um, there's, there's the notion of sort of managing uh, a virtual resource and, and not, not, um, not unusual here, I think, is uh, you know, uh, a need to sort of describe uh, the terminology for, for managing both virtual and physical memory. So, so um, just like we do in the OS world, when we talk about allocating virtual memory, we, we call that reserving. When we, when we put a physical backing store on it, that's, that's called commit. Um, in the context of understanding what, what the, uh, a texture looks like in memory, uh, we talk about texture shape. And, and the reason that, that texture shape is interesting is that if we want to coalesce things into arrays, they sort of need to have the same shape, same format. Um, not necessarily exactly the same size, although that helps too. Um, in the old days, uh, and still in, you know, in regular use to, uh, today, uh, texture atlases are how we get a bunch of textures uh, sort of logically uh, into, into one single texture image. Uh, and it's a straightforward thing to do, but it does have uh, impact on your content pipeline. It, it produces uh, sometimes some, some difficult situations with respect to things like uh, uh, border filtering or, or uh, wrap modes. Um, and you have to be careful about uh, a texture uh, bleeding at higher MIP levels when you start combining textures, texels from, from sort of physically distinct textures. Um, the nice thing, though, with texture arrays is, uh, and this is something that got introduced in GL3 uh, and, and DX10, um, these are arrays of textures uh, that have the same shape and format, um, and, you can, and you can generally have a lot of them. Uh, filtering works like you'd expect. It's like they're actually separate loose textures, uh, with the exception that, that you don't have to bind a new one, you can just, you can just reference the, the texture uh, array element uh, in the texture fetch call. And, the, and things like uh, determination of, of MIP level and things like that are done just as if it were a single 2D texture and you don't have to worry about um, uh, those, those differential calculations getting off. Um, so, so here I'm sort of trying to show the, the organization of a bunch of different texture images, sort of they, they get lined up um, sort of nicely in, in an array. So um, when, when we do uh, provide these, these textures in, in arrays like that, you can quickly sort of see that, that um, the amount of memory taken up uh, sort of starts to look large. Uh, one nice thing about sparse texture in this context um, is that, that we can create an array allocate a large amount of virtual memory for it, but not actually allocate any, any um, physical memory until we start needing to populate the data. Um, and, and so uh, what, what we'll wind up doing here is using uh, this ARB sparse texture. And uh, this, this diagram sort of is, is to, to um, illustrate what a sparse texture looks like. You probably have seen um, talks or, or heard uh, uh, talks uh, from Id and, and you know, um, other, other people about how mega texture works. Um, the idea of a sparse texture is not a, not a new one, uh, but it's actually a, a pretty interesting concept, and, and there are places where, for example, in shadow mapping, where um, you, you need very little of, uh, for example, the finest MIP level um, in, in a shadow map, um, and, if, and if you wanted to have sort of perfect shadowing, um, uh, the, the best uh, shadow map would be a sparse uh, shadow map with, with very little data uh, in, in the finest MIP level usually. Uh, but there are other places where this is actually interesting. Um, sparse, uh, when, when you have sparse textures, it, it can be a good way to, to manage texture paging, so you can pull things in a little at a time, a tile at a time, rather than, say, a whole level at a time. Um, and then there are other cases where you, you want to go ahead and create the texture, um, and then you're going to stream in the finer levels over time, and you want, you want the uh, app to, to start up and start rendering something immediately. Um, and so bindless texture is, uh, is another sort of neat thing that basically says, once you've got this notion of, of in, instead of having the, the, the texture name and its uh, handle, uh, or its binding point, which texture um, unit it's attached to, you, we, you just say, make this thing resident and give me a pointer to where it is. And this pointer is a pointer that the GPU um, uh, can use to directly address the thing, 
And, and inside GLSL, you can just call a text, do a texture fetch on this thing. And so, so now, uh, where you get the, the texture from isn't from a binding point in the API, it's just uh, a variable that lives in a uniform buffer somewhere or it's passed in um, as, as an attribute. Um, so this you know, becomes really powerful because now um, this mechanism means that you don't ever have to call active texture, you don't ever have to call bind texture. Uh, those things that might make it difficult to reduce the number of API calls that you're making now become a lot simpler. Um, so, so the advantages of this, this approach are that it works uh, pretty naturally. You don't have to do a lot of pre-processing. Um, using the array approach, you can, you can reduce uh, texture header thrashing, and, and that's really a good thing. Um, and, and then, the, you know, for, for a lot of people, the, the active management of your own texture memory and saying, here's what I want to be in video memory, here's, uh, and, and I'm going to manage that explicitly, um, is appealing. Uh, certainly, you know, people that have worked on consoles like the idea of being able to have a very explicit control over their memory management. Um, it's both faster on the CPU and faster on the GPU. Um, the, some of the downsides are that texture, uh, textures used to be addressed when you would, when you would uh, fetch um, by, by uh, an API active texture sort of binding reference, um, you only sort of needed seven bits to, to specify which texture you were going to fetch. So now these, these uh, things, because we're using arrays and we're using bindless, it's 64 bits for the handle, and then it's 32 bits, which could be less, uh, but, but for practical reasons, 32 bits for the, the element of the texture array that you're going to sample from. And, um, uh, and so, so, so that sort of adds a little bit of extra sort of burden for you um, uh, on, the, on, on the shader execution side, but it's not, it's not a, you know, an outrageous uh, a thing. Um, and sparse texture um, right now is, is a fairly new extension, so you, know, we should, we, you should sort of expect that you may run into some bugs that haven't been seen before, but we'll, we'll get you know, those addressed as soon as, as soon as we encounter anything. So just let us know if you, if you see something funny. Um, another thing about sparse texture is that um, the, the size of the texture has to be a multiple of, of the tile size. Um, even more sort of awkward than that is, is you, have to, you don't get to know what the, the size of the tile is until runtime. You have to query that from the driver, and it could be different for different hardware. Um, so that could be an asset management problem. I think in practice there will be some very, very stable and expected tile sizes, so probably shouldn't worry about that a great deal, though you will have to have the code to check. Um, and, and so I, I uh, want to talk a little bit about how you would manage textures in an array like this, um, but I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because um, I want to make sure that John has uh, a, a, lo a lot of time to talk about the next thing. Um, but this feeds into that. Um, and so, so the idea here is, is when you're creating a new texture, the way you would normally do it is you would just go and create a new texture object and you would populate it with data. Now that you've moved to a model where you're, you're going to put it in as an element of an array, you actually have to create the texture array or find one that's already suitable to, to allocate a slot out of. So, so basically what we'll do is we'll go and find out how many layers uh, are available for sparse arrays of textures. It's usually a pretty large number, and I think the minimum maximum is 2K. So you're sort of guaranteed it's going to be you know, a, a pretty reasonable size. Um, if, if the texture that you're trying to create also is a um, is a, an internal format that you haven't seen, then you'll sort of need to step through the, the code for determining how many different um, uh, tile sizes there are and pick a, an appropriate one. Again, I think you have to have code for this, but I think you can probably expect that, that for example, 64K um, uh, is probably the, the amount of memory that will be in a, in a tile, and then the layout will generally be uh, something that you can plan on uh, being stable over time. Uh, uh, I think in, in other uh, sort of areas, I think there's a desire to actually standardize that. And it'd be good to sort of get feedback from you guys if you think that, that a standard size is better than a query. Um, I, I kind of think that it's obvious, but, uh, but uh, it'd, be, it'd be good to hear back from you about that. Um, so so you, you bind the texture, you set its um, texture sparse parameter to true, which means now the allocation is actually going to be virtual only. Um, and then you set the, the, the page size. Uh, and then you go and allocate the, the thing with uh, texture storage 3D like you normally would. Uh, however, that's just now virtual allocation. And then specifying the texture data, you have to go and locate uh, an element of the array that you're going to put your texture data in. And you commit uh, the pages that you actually want to be uh, backed by physical memory. 
Um, and then once you've done that, you now actually have physical memory associated with that element, and you load texture data just like you would with any, uh, any other kind of texture, so just with uh, sub-image 3D. Um, and you can use PBO if, if you have a PBO process. Um, and then freeing the textures, you just change the, the um, text page commitment to false, and, and the driver knows, OK, I can throw that memory away now. Um, so, so there are a couple of things here. The, the process of creating a bind list uh, texture handle is sort of interesting. You, you, uh, you can create a texture um, and set its sampler properties uh, either on the texture object or with a separate sampler. And then when you request a handle, it fixes those properties. Um, and, and then the, the handle itself is immutable. The, the data inside the texture is mutable, but the actual sampling properties and things are, are now fixed for all time. Um, so, so you set up a sampler, you set up the texture that you want, you get a handle to it, that, that makes it uh, uh, an actual bindless texture, and then you make it resident uh, before you use it. And, uh, and that's pretty much what happens. And then inside your GLSL, uh, you have a, um, a struct that contains the, the, um, the, the texture array and then the, the element of that texture array that you're gonna fetch from. And now where you get that, this information is up to you. Any, any mechanism for getting sh uh, data into your shader is suitable for populating this field and then using it to do a texture fetch. So you can do it um, by traversing um, you know, uh, uh, buffer object, uh, uh, UBO kind of data, or you can, you can pass it in by uh, an indirect texture lookup or, or any of those kinds of things. Um, occasionally it may come up that you want to sample the same texture two different ways. And the way you handle that case is uh, you, have a, you, you set up a sampler, a different sampler object, and, uh, and say, for example, you wanted to change the base level from zero to one so that you're, that you're only ever fetching from, from level one and up on a texture. You'd create a sampler like that, then you would get texture sampler handle uh, with this new sampler object, and it'll give you a new unique handle for the texture, um, and then when you use that, it always uses base level one, um, and you can do the same thing for filtering properties and things like that. Um, and, and then the, the texture it becomes resident uh, when, when you make it, make it resident, and each handle needs to be make, made resident that way. Um, so there was a lot of hand-wavy discussion about how all this stuff works, and, and um, with, with an API that's uh, relatively complicated, it's probably important to actually see real working code. So if you wanna go to, to this link and, and uh, check out code that actually uses these APIs and compiles and runs and stuff, uh, this is where you should, should look. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to John. Uh, thank you, Cass. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the last thing that we wanted to talk about, oh, sweet, you left me the right amount of time. Thank you, sir. Um, the last thing we want to talk about is basically, let's draw all the calls, right? Um, so basically the problem is, uh, I hear this over and over and over again. This is the motivation for an entirely new API. You want more draw calls of smaller objects. Uh, D3D is slow at this. Naive GL is faster than D3D, but it's not fast enough. You want 5x, 10x, 15x, 20x. Uh, you're able to get it on uh, consoles, and it's frustrating that you're not able to get it on uh, the PC. I, I actually will make the assertion that this is uh, an XY problem. The Y here is like, you're, you're saying, I, I want more draw calls. And I say, I don't think you care that it's really more draw calls, right? You just, you want small, you want to be able to render efficiently small geometry groupings. You want more objects. Um, well, that's something that we can do. So first, we'll talk about some background. W what makes the draw call slow? We'll basically look at uh, a, a case of a real-world uh, application that we've taken traces of, and, and then we'll try and make some improvements and see where we get from there. Um, we're also gonna introduce just a pretty simple draw call cost visualization uh, to try and help make sense of it. So <clears throat> the slow draw calls. Validation, uh, if you've talked to me before you know, about this, validation is, is basically, it's, it's the elephant in the room. And the, the problem is that pre-validation is really, really hard. I, I hear a lot of times people will say, but every application is doing basically the same thing. I don't find this to be true at all, uh, honestly. What, 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 what really um, sort of, I, there's basically this experiment. You can take, say, 16 entry points that are your most important entry points and write them down, and then ask your neighbor to see his list. And they're probably not actually the same entry points. Uh, and that sort of leads into why pre-validation is difficult. 
Um, I, I sort of, uh, you know, after working on CPUs for a long time and working in games, I, I find that the GPU is basically pretty much the most complicated state machine I've ever dealt with. It's absurdly complicated. And the problem is that any one of the little states that it could be in uh, may have a problem. Uh, and we don't, we don't really like talking about those problems. Usually, hopefully, it's just an overall kind of performance is better if you could be in this state instead of this one, then that would be better. Um, but sometimes it's, it's not just performance. Uh, there are millions and millions of tests that cover NVIDIA GPU functionality, uh, and honestly, there could be 10x that many, and we would still feel like we need more. Um, and th this sort of all comes from the fact that basically, uh, you know, speed and power savings on the GPU come from fixed function hardware. But fixed function hardware means the GPU is rigid. It's not general purpose, and it's hard to say, oh, I'll fix this in software. Um, all right, so it's fine. You maybe, maybe you buy my premise that pre-validation can be hard. Um, let's assume you do. So how can app devs mitigate these costs? This is the same advice that everyone has offered for as long as I've you know, been in or around the game industry, uh, you know, minimize state changes. Um, but I wanted to sort of uh, uh, clarify this a little bit. Like, if you look at the cost of a draw call in GL, there is basically a small fixed cost, no matter what the draw call is, and then there's the cost of validating all of the changed states. So um, basically, you know, when you change different things, the, 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 the uh, cost of that draw call is actually reflected differently. Uh, this is definitely, I feel like GL is much more sensitive to this than uh, D3D is um, for some reasons that I probably don't have time to talk about right now. But, uh, um, but you know, the thing is, is that that advice that we've been saying for 20 years, it kind of sucks, right? I mean, artists want lots of materials. They want small, you know, they have small pieces of geometry. They want those to render. They want them to be efficient and pretty. And I think that this is all just sort of the wrong way to think about it. I think that the way that, you know, you should be able to tell your artist's work is like, I just want to go to you and say, hey, man, you just, just make me something that's pretty, and I, I will figure out how to make it work. Um, I think that's sort of the, the ideal uh, situation, so that's what we're going to try and work towards. So um, really quickly, though, let's talk about just the relative costs of different state machines. So I just uh, pulled a few um, from sort of a synthetic benchmark, and we find that you know if you're changing render targets, you can probably do about 60,000-ish of those a second. They're, they were I was actually surprised they were more expensive than program changes, uh, but there you are. Um, program changes, you know, on a recent uh, GPU, on a recent driver, it's, you know, 300K-ish. Um, you start getting better texture bindings. It's 1.5 million. So that's, I mean, that's, that's plenty, but it's still, you know, I want more, right? Uh, and then finally at the bottom, if you're just calling GL uniform, you can do that pretty frequently. It doesn't really uh, cost very much with sort of some basic uh, uh, exclusions. Um, Meaning that if you if you're uh, calling GL uniform and you're changing like a texture binding uh, tech, a texture sampler binding point, uh, that that call is actually expensive and it's actually it's worse than binding a texture surprisingly. Uh, so <clears throat> so now uh, we sort of have an idea of like what different state changes are going to cost. Let's look at uh, a real world um, API trace. Their their sort of call frequency. Um, this was uh, uh, captured from a real application. I don't want to air anybody's dirty laundry, so I'm not going to say who it is, but it is a very relevant app. It's something that uh, lots of you are working with or um, will work with. Uh, anyways, with an increasing frequency of change, we see that they, you know, they change render targets very infrequently, about once a scene. That's great. We like that. And then they have some uh, per scene uniform buffer and textures, and then they change their vertex stuff. Uh, that's great. Oh, we're doing good. And then they say, oh, you know, and then I've changed my material, and then I have this stuff at the bottom where I'm just basically, you know, frequently changing uh, uniform buffer contents or the binding and textures for uh, each material, for each object, for each piece. Um, and then I, I draw with that. So uh, we'll, to continue talking about this, we'll basically have this little visualization system. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically have uh, sets of rows that look like this. They, they're um, always in a fixed order. And basically, if the cell is lit up, then that means that that state was changed uh, prior to, or before this draw call, you know, prior to the last draw call. Um, and, uh, uh, and then at the end, we have our white that says, hey, this was a draw call. Um, so we'll look at these sort of, we'll read them down, and then we'll move to the right, and then we'll read down, and then we'll move to the right, and we'll read down. And they're going to be a lot smaller than this, so I kind of wanted to do a couple so we could talk about this. So in the second draw call, you can see in the first draw call, they change everything, and then they draw. And in the second draw call, they, uh, they did not need to change the program, and they didn't need to change texture, but they changed pretty much everything else. 
The third draw call, they changed. Uh, the, they didn't need to change alpha blending. They didn't mess with the UBO binding or vertex format, but they changed everything else, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OK, so now we have, uh, we have an explanation of what the problem is, where the cost is going. We have a real world, world data set to work with, and we have a way to visualize whether the things we're doing make sense. So uh, let's, let's set some goals. We want to minimize validation costs, and we don't want to pass the pain on to the artists. Um, so based on our uh, real world API frequency, we know that uniform updates and binding and texture updates and binding, those need to be fast. We're just going to move on. And uh, <coughs> using uh, uh, sparse bindless texture arrays conveniently just solves the texture problem. Um, so basically, we're going to set, uh, using the solution that cast derived, we're going to basically set all of the textures before any drawing begins. And then there's no need to change the textures between those draw calls. So that, um, now I wanted to mention that from the CPU's perspective, you know, just using bindless is sufficient. You don't need to do sparse bindless texture arrays. Um, but from the GPU's perspective, you will find that it's just always better. So you know, use sparse bindless texture arrays. I really like them. I like that that was easy, too. So looking at our increasing sequence of, uh, 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 frequency of change, we can see here that uh, we're going to eliminate our texture updates. This is sort of a, a sequence of calls somewhere in the middle of the, this trace that we were looking at. This was a, um, uh, this, I, did, I, I did have to pick a section of the, uh, uh, of the call. This particular frame had about 17,000 draw calls. Uh, this is you know a few hundred or a hundred-ish. Um, and I wanted to pick a section that was uh, that was that would both show what the technique was doing, but that wasn't like a pathologically amazing case, you know, because then you'd be like John, you're you're full of s, and that doesn't know any good. So when we eliminate our uh, texture binds, we can see now that hey, we've eliminated a bunch of of red. I'm happy with that. Um, so that's good. That means that those calls are all going to be cheaper, and and uh, and and life is good. Now let's uh, basically try and deal with our buffer updates. So. It's really common, uh, this is obviously a gross simplification, but it's really common to basically see games that just say, hey, I'm, about to re I'm ready to render this object. I'm walking through the visible object set. Let me update the buffer contents for this object that I'm about to draw, and now let me draw the object. And the problem with that is that then you're doing UBO binds and validation. But if you split it into two, and you, uh, if you split it into two phases, and you say, oh, I'll update a little buffer fragment, and I'll do that for every object, and then I'll do all of my drawing. Um, the, now we don't have uh, uh, UBO updates or UBO binding between draw calls. That's great. So I sort of dumped in this uh, concept, buffer fragments, and maybe you're going, I don't know what the hell that is, man. Uh, so the idea is basically that rather than one buffer per object, you want to share UBOs for many objects. So given that you might have had a struct object uniforms that contained the uniform data for one, uh, for one object to, to draw previously, now you just have an array of them. And you refer to them in GLSL as, uh, as an array. And you have some constant that you've defined called objects per kickoff or whatever. Um, for, uh, and the, you know, I, I wanted to, of course, mention that you can use persistently mapped buffer objects for even more win here. You can be updating these buffer fragments. You can do it from many threads. Uh, and be ready to go. And the one other thing I wanted to mention was that for uh, large amounts of data, basically like bones, you should consider using SSBO. Um, SSBO, in case you're not familiar with it, it's basically like large uniform buffers. Uh, they, they look the same uh, as um, uniforms in the shader with sort of one very minor syntactic change. They do have some cool new stuff. They have support for a better packing format. I, I, uh, I've, um, that one is particularly important with bindless handles. Um, and uh, uh, so it's you know, good to be aware of. Now, the one thing that uh, is unfortunate is that uh, they can be implemented in hardware as texture lookups. Um, and so that may mean you wind up introducing a dependent texture read. It's just something to be aware of. You know, we'll, I, I don't want it to sort of totally derail us. So we, um, we've, eliminated our, we've eliminated our buffer update overhead. This is where we were looking at before. We had all these buffer updates in blue. Uh, or all these buffer binds, sorry, for UBOs in blue. We had all these uh, uniform updates in dark green. And when we apply our new technique, we're talking to the API a lot less. And, uh, and all of these sequential calls that are you know, just white, 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 all by themselves are, are pretty cheap. They're only paying for uh, just that tiny constant um, cost. 
But it kind of irritates me, it hurts my heart that we have all this just like, let me just basically draw 50 of the same thing in a row with just slightly different parameters. I'd like it if I could just do all of them at once, right? Then I'd only pay the validation cost. I mean, that's already only paid once, but then we would only have to pay the constant startup cost once. And it turns out there is an extension to do this. It's uh, our multi-draw indirect. So our multi-draw indirect basically lets you specify a parameters to draw commands from a buffer. The buffer can be on the GPU, it can be on the CPU, um, it can be system memory, it can be, uh, it basically, it can come from everywhere. Um, that means that basically you can generate those things, you know, in parallel, however you want. Uh, I, I originally had a slide that explained multi-draw indirect, and then I was like, you know, it, I'm a coder, we're all coders, it's actually easier for me to see uh, here. So what I wanted to sort of point out was that for each of these sort of multi-draw commands, you basically specify uh, what the primitive type is. So I'm drawing triangles, the, in, the indexes are, uh, are uints, here's a bunch of commands, here's how many of the commands there are, here's how far apart the commands are. And this winds up, this is straight out of the spec. Um, basically, you are sort of guaranteed that this will execute the equivalent of if you were to do this, assuming there's no GL errors along the way. You'll wind up saying, hey, for you know, each thing, we're gonna, we're gonna interpret the uh, pointer from indirect plus the uh, stride as, um, as the uh, arguments to a draw command. Um, so, this does lead to one additional problem, which is that now you're in the shader and you're like, okay, I've got an index of all of these uniforms, um, or I've got, I'm sorry, I've got a, an array of all of this uniform data, and I don't know which one is mine. Um, so it turns out there's another extension, of course, uh, to, to basically deal with this. Uh, there is, uh, if you use shader draw parameters, it will add a built-in uh, to the vertex shader, which is gl underscore draw id arb, um, an instance ID uh, is already available. Oh, uh, I, I realize I did drop something from this. I wanted to mention this actually supports, uh, I, yeah, I, man, that's really unfortunate that I did that. So um, these, these draw commands that these support, they support basically everything for the sort of most complex GL draw calls. So they support specifying a base index, a base vertex, uh, uh, an instance offset, a vertex offset. Um, so the commands are basically the full sort of best GL draw command uh, that, you, that you have available. Um, so, uh, so when you're in the vertex shader, you can say, oh, my, you know, I can use draw ID and I can see, oh, I'm, I'm draw number three. So let me go look at you know, object uniform sub three. That's where my data is. Um, when you're not using multi-draw, that built-in will be zero. So you can write your code sort of assuming it's there. Now there is a sort of problem, uh, which is that you might have spotted, which is that right now, uh, this thing only gets exposed to the vertex shader. That's sort of unfortunate. Uh, I'm hoping, hoping, hoping that we'll have that rectified via an ARB or EXT extension real soon now. Um, so, all right, so let's apply everything. So I, I unfortunately I don't have firm perf numbers with me, but I did, I did them, I just wasn't ready to talk about them. Um, basically what we're seeing is a five to 30X increase in the number of distinct objects a second that people can uh, draw using these techniques. Uh, the interaction with the driver is significantly decreased, and um, although, but there's sort of the one downside, which is that the GPU perf can be affected, ne uh, affected negatively. So, you know, as always, profile. Uh, I wanted to show sort of a final uh, slide once we, uh, once we uh, see this, and we apply our multi-draw indirect, and here we've replaced tons of swaths of the, you know, just white calls with just these blue calls. Um, which are multi-draw indirects. And uh, if we look, compared to where we came from, um, we've, we've, we've gotten rid of a lot of driver interaction. So, uh, <clears throat> so um, with that, uh, please uh, go forth and work multiply. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions for Cass or I, I think we have maybe five-ish minutes? Yep, five minutes. Um, uh, just one second, they'll bring a mic up to you. Uh, I think there's a gentleman with a question down here. Uh, if you want to raise your hand so they can see. Uh, yeah, sorry, there we go. Um, hi. Uh, I have a question about uh, multi-threading the draw calls. OK. Uh, in our engine, the biggest bottleneck that we have is uh, the fact that we have to serialize the actual issuing of the draw calls in a single thread. So I mean, we can collect the state changes, the draw calls, everything with separate threads. Uh, as many as you like, uh, 
but uh, then we have to serialize the actual issuing of the draw calls. So th that is the biggest bottleneck that we have. So what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so the, the problem for GPUs is that like the, so GPUs are sort of massively parallel machines, but the conversation between the CPU and GPU is fundamentally fairly single-threaded. And this basically comes back to the fact that like, if you were able to say, I'm gonna draw object A and B and C and D, and you just told us all at once, draw A, B, C, D, and, and we don't have a, an ordering guarantee, then I, I can't actually tell you this is the correct picture for that sequence of commands. So um, that, that's sort of a big problem. Um, you know, I, I think it's okay for you to say, oh, I don't care if A gets drawn before B or gets drawn before C or D, but it's not okay for us to do that. Um, so uh, the, the thing is, is that basically with multi-draw and direct, what you wind up doing is um, by, by basically shmooing those uh, together, you're sort of eliminating the state changes that were going to cause problems. Those multi-draw and direct commands, they get just pretty much fed over to the GPU and decimated on the GPU. So they, you wind up just paying the validation once, and then and it winds up being pretty small. You get a pretty good multiplier from it. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah uh, just to, to, to add to that, I think the, the, the cost of serializing when you have a very chatty API usage can be expensive, but when you use you know, these techniques to, to reduce the number of API calls you make, generally speaking, you do an awful lot of work multiplication with a relatively small draw indirect call. That's right. Um, there was another call back there, or a question back there. Hi. These features all sound really great. And I was just wondering, um, to what extent can we rely on their support on users' hardware and driver right now? So, uh, OK, so they are um, supported for, I think all of these are supported on NVIDIA for Kepler. Um, they're, some of them are supported on Fermi, uh, and they have reasonable fallbacks. So, for example, um, uh, uh, Bindless is on uh, Kepler only, um, but uh, uh, on on. But I believe both us and AMD and actually Intel, I think, have implemented all of these for a, a pretty reasonable fraction of hardware. And then, I'm sorry, I, I, I should sort of clarify. The point is that there are uh, reasonable sort of fallbacks um, to, to be had here. We didn't have time to talk about them, but they're sort of like a fairly smooth perf function, you know, where you're like, oh, this isn't available. Okay, this is how I work around that not being available. And it's not as good a perf as I was getting before, you know, when I had everything, but it's not like, oh, shit, I just fell off a 99% cliff, uh, and now I'm 100x slower than I was before. Yeah, one, one other thing that's worth mentioning here is um, the, the ARB uh, naming convention for these extensions sort of implies the, uh, sort of a desire in the future to make these part of the core API. So, so even if they're not supported everywhere that you'd like today, this is sort of the direction that we expect to see things going. That's right. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, looks like there's one more back there. Yowza. It was, a, it was a great conversation yesterday about the intermediate representation for shaders. Uh, is the, what, are, what are you guys' views on that? And we would love to see it. Oh, I, um, yeah, I'd, I, I'd rather talk about this one non-publicly. I'm not, I'm not, so the, the thing is, is I'm personally not super in love with an IR because I don't feel like it actually solves the problems that, um, that developers feel like it solves. The, uh, one of the ones, the sort of speed issue, when we actually take profiles, we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of shaders of applications that you know, people have used over the years, and we run them against our compiler. And when we profile that, we find, oh, well, you know, about 90% of the time is spent in the optimizer. It's not spent in parsing. Parsing winds up being about 2%. So uh, an IR sort of you know, gets rid of that 2%, but I feel like you're going to be disappointed and come back to me and say, what, why, why did you not make this better? Um, so I, 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 I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not definitely, you know, I'm not saying NVIDIA says no. That's not the takeaway here. Uh, it's just that I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm cautiously uh, pessimistic that it's not actually going to fix the problems that you guys really need it to solve. So, and, and just to show, you know, the, the fact that there, is, there are differing opinions, I sort of think that, that an IR is a, a really important part of a, a healthy ecosystem. It may not solve every single problem uh, that, that people think it will, but uh, there, there are, uh, I think, significant values to be had from it, independent of whether or not it makes um, shader loading faster. I definitely think that's true, and I will say, you know, if, if you guys have a strong stance on this, um, the thing that you can do is, uh, uh, you know, Ideally, uh, join Kronos and participate in the ARB and, and just browbeat us into it. If enough of you do it, you know, you vote it, 
you're going to win. That's, that's how it works. Um, but even if you can't do that, you know, make sure that you have conversations with us and AMD and Intel and Qualcomm and Samsung and everybody who, you know, you need to talk to uh, to, to basically say, this is really important to me and, and get them on board. Um, I've got two more questions and maybe I've got time for one more. I've got time for one more question. All right, one more. Dan, Dan can I talk to you afterwards? Is that all right? <laughs> all right. So regarding the, uh, the bindless textures, is there any caveats or things that would cause a problem for using that in conjunction with uh, something like OpenCL or CUDA with regards to being able to generate that kind of data and then use it in that fashion? No, uh-uh. No. Oh, um, no, so bindless So bindless is sort of this neat extension because basically the hardware has worked this way for about nine years. It, it has always done this and what the GL driver was doing was resolving the texture number that you gave it into this GPU visible pointer that was already 64 bits. And, and, uh, and we, turn, you know, we ran profiles and we found out, oh man, we spend a lot of time in this cache miss, like this one where we're resolving this name. You know what would be better is we could just have a way to just give that pointer back to the application. They can give it to us later. It will already you know, be in cache and then we can just feed it down. And so, so that's what we did. So it just works. Effectively, it's substantially simpler than even yeah. the interop that we have today. That's right. Well, it, it, it doesn't change the interop that you have today. The interop that you have today will continue to work with bindless. They're sort of orthogonal. Uh, and I think that's probably it. If you have more questions, we're happy to hang around and chat. And uh, thank you so much for uh, coming and seeing us. We, we really expected about five of you. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're pretty excited. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks.